Okay, no large trumpet sound. I take it we are <laughs> we are live and open to the world now. Maybe nobody will join because there's so many parallel <laughs> sessions going on. <laughs> Which would yeah. be quite funny. <laughs> Can we see uh, how many people join? I'm like trying to real? see. Yeah. But I can't, I'm not sure where to look. If I click on people, there's nothing. Um, I don't know. It's a strange experience. <laughs> All right, let's start. Um, it's quarter past, I think. Is it quarter past <clears throat> in your part of the world as well? Yes. yes. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so we are. Very, I'm very pleased to have this breakfast session this morning with um, four very interesting co-philosophers. Uh, we have philosophers of philosophy and metaphysics from the universities of Leiden, Liverpool, Australian National, Amsterdam, and Stellenbosch, and we mm -hmm. have been asked to talk about the concepts of gender and sex and how philosophical understandings of gender and sex can help the struggle for gender equality and sex equality. So clearly there are these two uh, um, dimensions to our conversation. The one is the issue of social justice and the other one is um, philosophical inputs around these concepts. Now, when I started to think about this, I realized that the very use of the term sex and gender and the way that they are used together and used to differentiate, um, to distinguish between uh, the two phenomena was already an attempt to address an enormous um, instance of social injustice, which is the historical oppression and exclusion of women from the public domain, um, the confinement of women um, in the name of their sexual difference to the domestic, to the private sphere, and to material work in support of a material world. Uh, and that was done to set men free to accede to the higher functions, so-called higher functions of um, intellectual engagement, politics, um, artistic expression, and so on. Um, so it was in revolt against this historical situation in the West that Western feminism came up with the distinction between sex and gender, which was largely drawing on something that is also very idiosyncratic to the Western tradition of thinking, and that is the old mind-body dualism and hierarchy that we've um, that has been very prominent in Western thinking um, already since Plato and Aristotle. So uh, what some feminists drew our attention to is not just that the, um, the oppression of women in this tradition was a result of the mind-body dichotomy, but also that the mind-body dichotomy itself was strongly gendered from the start. Um, so that um, the way in which the dichotomy was framed meant that... Um, the material domain was regarded as dead matter and associated with femininity, and the mental domain was associated with active form and associated with masculinity. So when feminists in the early 20th century um, 
made the distinction between sex and gender. Sex fell on the side of matter and gender on the side of mind or culture or language. And that was one way in which feminists tried to open up a space in which they could contest the social situation because they thought that gender was the malleable side of the two. So materially, they thought that sexual difference was given, but that gender was a cultural product. Um, in other words, how we express or how we make sense of embodied differences, um, that, that could change. Um, but then clearly they reinforced this dichotomy precisely by creating this distinction as another form, as another manifestation of the same dichotomy and hierarchy. Um, so, so I'm wondering, so many different philosophers have come up with many different responses to whether this was in fact a good strategy for addressing gender inequality and sexual oppression. Um, and I think our philosophers here this morning also have different um, perspectives on this issue. And I hope that once they've given their inputs, we can have a nice discussion about it. Um, so another thing that we should actually also bring in is to say that from a non-Western perspective or a marginalized perspective in the world, um, the mind-body dichotomy has often been criticized as not only justifying the oppression of women, but also persons and aspects of reality that are designated as feminine. So it also has a pernicious history in the um, colonial, um, uh, colonial era, the new colonial, uh, the way in which nature and colonized peoples and racialized peoples were um, oppressed as well. So, so they're also the mind-body dichotomy played a big role. Um, furthermore, uh, it's, uh, the, uh, there's the mind-body dichotomy and the idea that sexes are given in nature has also had a pernicious effect upon all persons who live with more or less ambiguous and fluid um, sex and gender identities. So that is another aspect that we have to take into consideration when we try to think about the legacy of the sex-gender distinction. Um, and here I just want to give one example that maybe draws together some of these lines of criticism, um, and that is the, in the person of Bukhari um, which I think is well known across the world. She's a, a woman from the northern province of Limpopo in South Africa and a truly remarkable athlete. Um, she has won many Olympic medals and world championships, especially over the 800 meters. Um, but questions arose about her sexuality. And then it was discovered that she was an intersex woman with XY chromosomes and naturally elevated levels of testosterone. She was designated female at birth. And world athletics, in fact, then banned her from further competition on the world stage unless she underwent um, medi or took medication that would reduce her testosterone levels. And she's currently appealing against this um, at the European Court of Human Rights. So that is a very concrete example of the kind of social justice issues, I think, that... Um, come up for us in these days when we think about sex and gender and their meanings um, and what philosophers can do to, to take this conversation forward, uh, maybe to clarify some issues and help us to understand what is it that we owe someone like Kastor Um She also, of course, reminds us of the important concept of intersectionality that was coined by Kimberly Crenshaw, who said that we should not isolate um, issues of sex and gender justice from related systems of oppression that are intertwined and that reinforce and in all kinds of ways um, <coughs> shape the oppression of different uh, categories of women. So that class and race um, and issues like that, sexual orientation, also become important when we think about um, sex and gender justice. Um, I would say in Semenya's case, it makes it different that she's a black woman, that she's ambiguously sexed, and that she comes from a, a village, a rural village in the global south. So all of these things have to be taken into account if we want to talk about justice for her. All right, I'm going to, that's my short introduction. <laughs>
Um, and now I would very much like to hear uh, my colleagues giving their inputs. Um, and the first speaker is Michael Hauskeller from Liverpool. Thank you, Michael. You are muted, Michael. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you very much, Louise. Um, it is a bit difficult for me uh, to speak here, not only because I'm the only man on the panel, but also because my position is rather um, reactionary compared to your position. Um, in terms of the general topic of our, of our panel, gender, sex, and social justice, I think it's important to um, clarify first what those um, concepts mean. So when we're talking about social justice, um, we are talking about fairness, about everyone having equal opportunities, um, about nobody being unfairly disadvantaged. We're talking about access to goods, both material and immaterial. Um, and sex and gender um, in, in relation to social justice, um, we would have to think about equal treatment opportunities for women, or at least that is the traditional um, the traditional link that has been made. And when we talk about women, again, traditionally, what that means is female members of the human species. And in terms of fairness, equal treatment, social justice, um, it is important to, to see that this does not only concern rights, legal rights, political rights, moral rights, but also providing the right conditions, for instance, educational um, conditions to allow women to thrive and achieve the same as men. But that is still not enough because there are also certain expectations of what a woman should do, how she should behave, how she should organize her life, her role in society, and all this kind of thing. And we can call those expectations gender. Now, this brings us to the, to the traditional distinction between sex and gender that uh, Louise referred to. Sex is a biological reality there. It's a fact about you, and it's indeed immutable. Whereas gender, on the other hand, is a social construct, which you may or may not conform with or conform with to a larger or smaller extent. Now, that does not mean that sex is destiny. It does not confine you to any particular role. Now, it seems to me that, that all this is pretty straightforward. Um, however, things have changed. Now, the distinction is hotly contested and even dismissed, as Louise just did in her introduction, um, as deeply false and distorting and a persuasive lie. Now, I don't think that the distinction between sex and gender upholds, as Louise has alleged, the faulty Cartesian dichotomy of body and mind. But it seems to me that denying that distinction is tantamount to denying the very reality of the body. And we are actually embodied creature. And I think embodied creatures, and I think it's important not to forget this. Um, we now have a situation where an increasing number of biological males claim that they are in fact women and are less vocal and smaller but still sizable number of biological females claim that they're in fact men. Some say they are neither, some say they are both. Um, and I'm wondering what we should make of such claims. Are trans women actually women? Are trans men men? And why does it matter to discuss those questions? Well, it seems to me because it has concrete social justice implications. For instance, I mean, Louise already gave an example. Um, with respect to trans women, we can ask, are trans women treated fairly if they're prevented from participating in women's sports competitions? Is it fair, on the other hand, to the participating biological women, um, or as a jargon has it, cis women, to let trans women with their perhaps superior physical strength compete against them? What about women-only spaces, public bathrooms, changing rooms, prisons? Who counts and who does not count as a, wom as a woman directly affects people? And it mostly affects women. 
what does justice and fairness require here? This is not at all obvious. This is something that needs to be discussed. And this is how the metaphysics of gender becomes relevant. And by that, I mean what makes a woman a woman and what makes a man a man. That's all from me for now. Thank you. Wonderful. Spot on with five minutes. Thank you, Michael. Uh, the next person is Marie Mikula. She is from Amsterdam, University of Amsterdam. Great. Um, many thanks. So I'm um, not entirely 100%, so hopefully I will not um, start <laughs> coughing in the middle of this. My apologies in, in advance. Um, so I'm coming from a particular um, sort of theoretical background in philosophy, analytic feminist philosophy. And what uh, people in my um, disciplinary background have worried about is, in, indeed, as both Louise and Michael have said, um, traditionally has been very much um, the topic of what does it mean to be a woman? What does, what does it mean? Um, what, does, what does gender um, consist in? And as already noted, this has a sort of theoretical background in a second wave feminist um, theorizing, whereby the idea was that we might all be sexed in a certain way, and that might be a kind of a biological reality. But nonetheless, um, sex, as Michael said, is not destiny. And in fact, that positions are socially in ways which then generate gendered individuals. So a very kind of classic case of the sex-gender distinction would be one where we think um, those who have um, female bodies are socialized, they're treated in certain kinds of ways, which then generates behavioral and emotional and psychological traits. So there isn't anything innate about caretaking um, for those who are female bodies. This is something that we've been socialized. These are social roles that that we've been um We've learned, so to speak, um, in the um, as we as we grow old and and as we are um, in as many ways also um, compelled um, to be. Now, I think the sex gender distinction has actually been um, already hotly contested in feminist philosophy for decades. This is the contestation is not in any way new, and specifically in the late eighties um, and the early nineties. Positions that were very skeptical of this arose. Um, two very major figures in my disciplinary area are Elizabeth Spellman and Judith Butler, who effectively argued that there is no such thing as being a woman that is sort of transhistorical and cross cultural. Um, and this indeed put quite a lot of pressure precisely on issues about social justice. So, how is it that we should then think about feminist issues? Um, about social justice for women if there is no such thing as the category of women in the plural. We can only talk about individual women. And this seems to be politically an extremely um, problematic move. Um, we can't make policies for individuals. We, they are always going to be in some sense group-based. So for the past 20 to 30 years now, well, maybe still 20, um, 25 years, feminist philosophers have worried um, in, in a great deal, to a great extent, about this question, what does it mean to be a woman, so that we can base some political uh, policies, political projects um, on this notion of, of gender. And I also, in my previous work, worried much about this. So I spent most of my career until recently worrying much about this. And uh, this was the topic of my PhD thesis. I've written um, extensively about, about gender but I've come to the view in the last, um, well, less than a decade, but certainly in the last five to seven years, that this question, the metaphysics of gender, is relatively unimportant, in fact, when we're trying to think about social justice. So it doesn't, when we're thinking about the kinds of ways in which some people are, as Michael said, um, perhaps being denied material access to some material goods, or treated in ways that they ought not to be treated. Um, what I argue or what I've um, suggested in my previous work is that we don't need to know substantively what it means to be a woman. We need to have some gender terminology in order to do social research. But this doesn't have to be, in a sense, a metaphysically deep. We simply need to have a, a way of um, 
kind of very thinly cashing out who the people are, for instance, who are subject to certain forms of, say, um, violence. So if you look at um, sort of patterns of things like street <clears throat> harassment, or if we look at patterns of domestic violence, there is a certain class, a certain group of people who tend to be um, disproportionately affected by this. Those are the ones that usually get designated as women. And for me, that's enough. I don't then need to take an extra step of trying to say something metaphysically deep about what it is to be a woman that in some sense positions people in those ways that they are subject to certain forms of power and material um, deprivation. And again, the current discussions about abortion in, in America are very pertinent to this. I think it's clear for us to say sort of who the people are who are affected by these policies without having a deep metaphysical account of, of gender. So that's my, my input is a, a sort of, um, that I'm, I'm now undoing most of the work that I've done in my philosophical <laughs> career so far, um, but I hope that there will be fruitful um, further ways to take the discussion. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. With both of you, I just want to jump into the conversation, but let us um, go then next to Anami. Thank you, Anami. Anami is from um, Leiden. Yeah, thank you, Louise. Well, um, uh, my point starts from the concern that was raised by uh, Michael about the relationship between uh, what is called cisgender uh, identifying with the gender assigned to a person at birth and transgender that is not uh, identifying with the sex assigned at birth. And it also uh, forms an answer to uh, to Mar uh, Mary's problems with uh, the metaphysics of gender. So my suggestion is to turn to phenomenology. Uh, so, and my thesis, um, uh, and it would be lovely to discuss that, is that uh, the cisgender and transgender uh, are not opposed to each other, but uh, that, uh, in fact, transgender articulates and ma manifests what uh, cisgender entails as well. And um, I will explain what I mean in a few steps. So first, let's, um, we need to start from concrete figures, I think. So more and more people today do identify as transgender. Research in the United States, but also in the Netherlands, there's a famous gender clinic in Amsterdam, shows that the prevalence of what is uh, called uh, in the medical circles gender dysphoria is high and it is also growing in the last de decades. So on average, I would say that in the Western world, in uh, uh, about one in 30 persons identifies as trans, and that is one kid in every school class. And I use trans here as an umbrella term for gender non-binary, for gender queer, for transsexuality, and also for other forms of, uh, um, of trans. The problem is, however, as uh, Michael already um, uh, 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 showed, is that in the current debate, transgender is often opposed to cisgender. And that implies that the new binary comes on top of the old binary male-female. And similar to that old binary of male and female, cis is hierarchically on top and trans is considered as abnormal or as gender variant. And I don't think that this politicized debate in which the two are opposed is very fruitful because it, for instance, uh, polarizes feminists and transgenders. And what is more important, perhaps, I also think that it's, it's not true. So um, here comes my phenomenological take, uh, how, how to investigate this thesis and how to substantiate it. So um, uh, I suggest to take a starting point in the experiences of people and what you, for instance, when you study uh, the, the ideas about the gender dysphoria of trans people, uh, uh, it shows that they do not uh, consider this whole concept uh, as such, but that they make a distinction between two kinds of dysphoria, namely body dysphoria and social dysphoria. So the notion uh, of gender dysphoria is uh, a too general notion and they experience a distance from their body or, or from parts of their body and a distance from the social perception of their identity. So my claim is that trans is a complex interaction between one's body, 
one's sense of self or a personal identity and the social reception and representation of a person. And the same goes for cisgender. But the difference is that in the case of trans, these three aspects of a person do not coincide and that in the case of cisgender, they do. So in the case of cisgender, the integration of these factors goes unquestioned. In the case of trans, there are breaches between body, self and social representation of a person. And that implies that trans and cis do not oppose each other, but that through understanding trans, we might also get an idea of what uh, cisgender implies. And I think that is an important ta task for gender philosophers, um, like we are to understand the, the, these dominant and normative uh, gender identity uh, um, that is cisgender in, in our world. So um, do I still have some time? I could explain how this relates to sex and gender to the distinction because I very much um, uh, joined the, the uh, earlier speakers uh, in that sex uh, and in that uh, questioning of the sex gender distinction. I think it's a very unclear distinction and that has to do, for instance, with the fact that Gender refers to two things at large. It refers to gender identity, uh, a person's feeling about uh, uh, who they are, and, and it also uh, pertains uh, uh, to social constructions, to representations on a ma macro level. So, and also, as was mentioned before, sex and gender are not distinct from each other. Uh, for instance, uh, a person's behavior may also change their, their, their body. Think of eating a healthy or unhealthy food or drinking or smoking. And these kinds of behavior are also partly gendered. So there's an interrelationship between the two. And it's not, well, it just, just doesn't work, this distinction. It's a uh, um, too uh, simple distinction um, in order to explain this complex uh, phenomenon of gender. And so um, my suggestion is that instead of thinking in terms of, of this nature-culture distinction, we need three aspects, namely uh, uh, body and the relationship to one's own body through body image, for instance, which is a phenomenological notion. Uh, uh, self or identity, uh, self understanding of a person's identity, and then the, the social aspect, which is still a very uh, large uh, category. It's about social representations, but it's also about how a person is perceived in its uh, social uh, environment. So, um, I think we should complicate uh, this too simple distinction. Yeah. Okay, let's leave it to that. Louise, sorry, I saw that. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Thank you, Anami. And uh, we move on to Fiona Jenkins from Australian National University. Thank you. And I, I hadn't realized how well our discussions would actually sort of tie in together. And I, I, I wanted to... Um, take my sort of departure from some things that have been happening in the federal election that's about to draw to a close, thank goodness, in Australia. But it's it began with the whole issue of trans women in sport as being at the forefront of the um, conversation. It was the best issue to blow up in the first weeks of the campaign. And I think it's, you know, that's really interesting that that, that becomes such a um, political issue. So, so basically it was a... Um, a liberal candidate somewhat to the right of mainstream politics who said it was outrageous and unfair that trans women were competing in sports. And she was backed by our liberal prime minister who, um, you know, wanted to characterise this as, a, as an issue of common sense, um, a concern of ordinary people, and, you know, was really willing to kind of uh, follow this track in, um, in his political campaign. Um, so my question really is, what does this appeal to common sense in relation to the regulation of gender tell us about really the debate that we've just been having? And just to give some kind of context uh, of how things seem to stand in Australia, um, I think broadly we have pretty wide evidence of, of background acceptance of, um, of transgender people being involved in sport based on their gender affirmation. 
Um, we have quite detailed policy that's been developed by the Human Rights Commission, along with professional sport bodies that take account of contextual factors um, in individual sports about strength and so forth. Um, there's very little reliance on things like hormone levels to kind of measure, um, you know, what would be the appropriate uh, kind of um, uh, methods to take on board. And so, um, you know, this is against a backdrop where younger generations, of course, we see this all the time in universities, are um, generally much more liberal um, around gender identity than their previous generations. So we see a massive change and evolution going on. Um, if you talk to anyone under the age of 30, I think there's a sense that gender identity is becoming more fluid and um, it's not at all going in the way that gender conservatives would, would like it to. Um, so we clearly have a culture war around this, this issue um, in Australia as elsewhere. Um, uh, here in Australia, again, as I think in, in other places, feminist philosophers have actually played quite a central role in putting academia at the centre of these um, debates, um, often very hostile forms of, of disagreement. And I think we've had um, kind of uh, some statements of the, the various sides from, from Michael and Marie already in this conversation. So I'll skip over what I was going to say about that. I mean, there's clearly different, um, very strongly held philosophical perspectives on these questions. Um, but how should we understand these arguments in the political um, space? And, and what does it mean when they are being sort of touted as a, a kind of common sense that, you know, has a political role to play? And I think it's really interesting to note that they often don't seem to be very directly about gender at all, these kinds of intense disagreements. They become disagreements about speech and who is able to express their views freely. So issues around um, academic freedom in the university context, but more broadly, issues around um, democratic values, um, such as that of free speech and the right to express one's own opinion, um, become the kind of central terms of these um, disagreements. Um, and I think, you know, this is really important to understanding the sense in which this is the site of a culture war. Um, uh, one of the things that the Prime Minister is relying on is a, um, uh, a right-wing response to the idea that your views are being silenced in terms of political correctness. It has a very, very political um, context in that way, which means that it's about speech and what speech represents, not, not in the abstract, not as a discussion of kind of theoretical ideas about sex and gender, but really as a site of authority. Um, so, you know, it's, it's about speech as a site where valid forms of authority can be exercised, I think. It's much less, than, um, not much less about free speech as a place of debate. It's about speech as a site where things can be said to be definitively so. And I think that's, that's something very interesting. Um, so I would say that on many occasions behind what pose as assertions of the, the facts about biological sex or the facts about um, what that means for fairness are often primarily assertions of entitlement. There's a claim to particular kinds of authority in speech, which is often at stake. So, for example, um, you know, one of the issues here is who am I allowed to overrule in their assertions of identity? And I think that's manifest when I claim a right to assert that transgender women are really men. Like if I say something like that, then I think I'm, I'm claiming the right to overrule others in how they um, present and assert their identity. Um, who am I permitted to disqualify, for example, from, from sport? Um, you know, by making very general statements about what counts as fair um, without any, you know, particular regard for context or my particular role in adjudicating such things. Um, who am I allowed to generalise about? Um, you know, when I make pronouncements about um, men's propensity for violence, for example, being the reason that... Uh, transgender women should be kept out of um, women-only spaces. I think that makes a certain kind of um, claim to authority to generalise about another group. Um, and so most broadly, what I see in these cultural wars is a preoccupation with the question about what I'm allowed to say 
that has really important entailments about my power over others and over the worlds that we occupy um, in common. And I think this is really an important backdrop to the claim to common sense, um, which is often uh, being um, used as the term that captures um, a kind of resistance to the emergence of new norms of um, recognition. And I think the fact that these issues concern speech acts is actually really interesting in relation to one of the theories of, of gender that um, Murray mentioned, which is Judith Butler's account of gender as performative, because I think in speaking about gender as performative, we really need to pay attention to the way in which that is working with an understanding of speech acts and the way in which speech acts claim a certain kind of authority. And I think, you know, this broader um, involvement, this co-implication of what we say about gender and the kind of authority that we exercise through what we say about gender is really pertinent to some of the current um, political discussions around this issue. Thanks very much, Fiona. Okay, so how shall we go about this? Um, I thought that maybe Michael's input right in the beginning um, challenges the whole conversation in the sense that he, he said um, we are forgetting or neglecting the reality of the body sometimes in our thinking about sex and gender um, and that sex is an immutable given. Did, is that what you said, Michael? I think so. Sorry, say again. The last you said sex is an immutable given. Well, that is a traditional view, but I uh, tend to agree, yes. Right. Well, and so, so uh, not, notwithstanding what uh, Anime said earlier, that, of course, what we do, how we behave, um, um, influences what we are, right? So you, you mentioned smoking, drinking alcohol, and so on. That changes our body. But it doesn't change the sex of our body. Right. So uh, whether you're a heavy drinker or a light drinker or smoke a lot uh, or don't, that doesn't make you more or less a woman in terms of your sex. Uh, so whatever you do to your body, you, you keep the sex that your body displays. Right? But mm -hmm. that, that doesn't mean anything about what you can and cannot do or should or should not do. It is a fact, but the question is, the, the really interesting question is, to what extent should, should that bodily fact affect your behavior and, and things that you can do? And so how relevant is it? Um, and I think it's not very relevant, you know? Of course there are distinctions, um, but to what extent are those distinctions relevant? And okay. they are not relevant. That is why. Okay. I think I think uh, Michael poses a challenge to us. Um, so I, I I think we only have nine minutes left. It's an extremely short um, short discussion. Can I can I give each of the three of you a chance to respond to this question about what happens to the material world? Um, are we losing it from sight, or what place does the material um, let's say the old idea that body bodily difference, sex difference is just what um, it's just a characteristic of our species. We are a dimorphic species. Sexual difference is important for reproduction. Do we do we throw that out of the window? What do we do with the material dimension? Um, if I can go to um, Marie first, uh, then Anami, then Fiona. <clears throat> Right. Thanks. So I actually disagree with the fact with what you just said, Michael, in the sense that I think it's so it might be my, that I mean, obviously, our bodies go through all sorts of changes. Um, I might not go through some extremely radical changes by sort of smoking or drinking in terms of my reproductive abilities. But it is a very big question of how we should actually define sex. So I do think that we actually do go through very radical changes in just by way of what are the conceptual schemes? What are the conceptual tools that we use in order to fix what sex amounts to? And biologists, people who are experts on this, they disagree. There is no accepted way of fixing the supposed sexual dimorphism of human beings. And so, again, thinking about, you know, what, what happens? I mean, if we take something like reproductive ability to be some kind of a marker of sex, then quite a lot of 
so to speak, us uh, native women will stop being females at a relatively early age because we lose the ability simply because we go through menopause and so on. Um, so I do think that there's that that I I think there's a lot of um, emphasis on examples and especially these culture wars that I'm I'm very unhappy about with things like you know women's toilets versus men's toilets um, you know sports, but I do think that there are quite a lot of underlying questions about how is it that we ought to think about sex to begin with, let alone gender. I don't think it's a it's an obvious issue at all. I don't think, I think it's extremely fraught. Um, and there really is no biological sort of um, agreement amongst the experts who work on this. Um. Yes, shall I continue? So I very much agree with uh, Mary and uh, mm -hmm. uh, have problems with the idea that uh, sex is a sort of fixed uh, something. Um, uh, and well, recently I've become a, a big fan of the work of a biologist uh, uh, who's also a gender theoretician, namely Anne Fausto Sterling. And she has written a lot of work that, that I think is very um, also um, can be can, can complement uh, Butler's Judith Butler's ideas about performativity because Judith Butler, of course, does not really develop this this bodily dimension uh, um, of uh, of gender. And what Fa Fausto Sterling shows is that um, uh, she, uh, uh, in different works, goes through all the the develop developmental stages of of a fetus. Uh, and she shows that uh, on all levels, on the genetical level, but also on the hormonal level, on the uh, level of the development of the gonads, the, the re reproductive organs, uh, and also on the level of the, uh, the external uh, genitals, uh, uh, changes, uh, variance is possible. And that there is not one uh, aspect that is conclusive uh, for gender identity. So, um, in, and in her work, she says, well, uh, biology does not fix uh, gender identity. And so she holds on to the distinction between gender identity and uh, 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 the body. Uh, and then um, she also uh, discusses all of these theories in, in psychology about gender identity. So she, she, has, she makes a very strong case for, on the one hand, uh, gender identity not being uh, related to one uh, single biological factor. And on the other hand, she also says uh, that uh, still gender identity is in the body. It is still bodily, uh, the way we walk, the way we, the way we talk, the way we, uh, we behave. There are, we, we relate it to, to gender. And um, uh, the interesting question that she poses is how do, did they get there? And I think that is one of the major tasks that we stand for as philosophers nowadays to uh, think about how these social norms enter the body and how they uh, get into the body. So, again, complicate instead of uh, thinking in terms of a sort of fixed matter. That's my um, main message. <laughs> So I, it seems to me we are saying the material is everywhere, but it's not clear cut. It's not stable. It's not given. Um, a Fiona. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think some of the. I mean, I, I would agree with the two preceding comments, and I, and I think that sort of approach to the phenomenological body is really important. I think whatever the body is, it's not merely biological. It's not merely a piece of matter. I mean, it's. It's, you know, when you're trying to pick that out and make that a really firm point of reference, I think there's, you know, a lot of decisions going on about, you know, that, that kind of abstraction down to a, a purely biological body. Um, and I think one of the one of the things interesting in the context of um, this discussion is is the sort of technologically mediated sex body. I mean, there's all sorts of ways in which we are now able to um, intervene medically into um things like hormonal um, kind of patterns and, you know, that there's a lot of anxiety, I think, around what it means for us to have these technologically mediated bodies, which are not natural bodies either. I mean, whatever their materiality is, it is not what we idealise as natural. Um, and, um, you know, in, in that respect, I think materiality is a very elastic 
concept um, and one that, yes, we want to pay attention to. I think we also do want to pay attention to, you know, when we're thinking about social justice, we want to think about the context in which issues arise for people. There are contexts of, you know, childbearing or breastfeeding where we want to think about what that what that means in terms of the, you know, materiality of the body. But if we ignore in those contexts the lived experience of the body, I think we go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, so that that would be my take on on this sort of idea that the biological somehow expresses the materiality of the body that we want to do justice to. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose the question then becomes, what do we do with this um, sex gender thing? Are we at the point where we want to say it's in hindering social justice more than helping it? Uh, Marie? It feels... I have to admit that it, it does feel that we are, as I, as I said, in some sense, the big questions about social justice, particularly at the moment, are getting dragged through the mud with these culture wars. And I do think that that's very much sort of hindering um, our discussions, even if we're thinking about the situation of trans people, um, irrespective of toilets and sports. And there's robust evidence that uh, there's a lot. They suffer discrimination on the job market and in the housing market to absolutely disproportionate amount to, to cis people or what we might call cis people. Um, and I do think that these kinds of issues about ac you know, material, access to material goods are getting very much sort of sidelined um, in the kind of cultural discussions. So I'm not, I'm not sure if the answer to that is get rid of all talk of sex and gender, but I certainly think that this... I, I like the idea that, Anime, you said that we should think about the experiences of people as starting points, because even if we hang on to some traditional notions of sex and gender, even then our experiences are going to be very different from, you know, one native sort of woman to the, to the next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Do, do, do you see that your session time has elapsed, but you can stay as long as you want. <laughs> Does this mean that we're offline or I don't know what's the, uh, it says on my computer still stream, uh, we are still streaming and we are still live. So I suppose the, if if there are anyone listen, if anyone is listening to us, then um, they will they will keep listening to us as long as we no, don't leave. We um, do have three attend uh, attendees. <laughs> oh, do we? How can yeah, you see we that? do. <laughs> um, all present people. Yeah. Oh, okay. I can't so maybe see they do want to ask a question. Let me see. Oh, I know Benda. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I see hands, but I don't know if they're waving or crying out to, to ask a question. Um, Benda, can you hear me? Do you want to ask a question? I think you have to grab the oh, mic. Oh, she wants the mic. Oh, okay. can, yeah? Can, can you try now? Um, I tried well, to get it's, it's open. It's opening. I see a sort of circle. Uh, <laughs> right. So maybe it takes a while. She's getting ready. Yes. Hello. Are you there? She wants the mic. I'm trying. Ah, oh, there's a mic up. <laughs> uh, Benda, can you maybe type the question? <laughs> oh my! She still wants the mic. <laughs> yes, I'm trying. I'm trying to give it. I keep on all the mics that I see. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm not sure how this works. There we go. I managed to join the discussion. Oh, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it's lovely to uh, join your session. 
Um, I, I must also add that I unfortunately joined about 15 minutes ago because I had to drop the kids at school. It's early in the morning here in South Africa. Nice to see you, Anami and Louise. <laughs> and I've been um, um, very fascinated by the um, kind of, um, it's this kind of a dichotomous position that emerged in your discussion. Um, and um, I don't know if it's accidental that the one, that the, um, the opposition is between the males and the females. <laughs> um, but yes, it remains a, um, a vexing question how um, gender is to be conceived and how it figures into our discussions around ethical political justice. Um, and I, I, I think the frustrating thing is that within the limited scope of a discussion like this, it is very difficult to actually reach any kind of um, decisive position. Um, but I was interested to hear of the, um, is it a biologist, Anami, that you referenced? Yeah. It's, uh... it, it does seem to, she does, or is it, is it he or she, does seem to offer us a way to um, progress a little bit beyond um, Butler's position. Yeah, I think I think so, so too. Um, and what is interesting is that she also refers to Butler, and she what well, she's more um, she's clo she, she's closer to Elizabeth Gross. She mentions Elizabeth Gross a lot uh, in Volatile Bodies, uh, so the older work. Uh, and uh, but and she, but she also um, uh, refers to Butler, and she has uh, well, there's one book, uh, Sex. Gender in a Social World that is very informative. It's a very small Routledge book. But uh, she recently also wrote an article um, with the beautiful title Gender Sex uh, are, um, well, I can't recall it. So, but this question about uh, 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 um, that. Um, that they are in the body, that they are still, that, that they are bodily, uh, but uh, uh, it are, uh, it's about, well, this interrelationship between these social norms and social relations. She focuses, she focuses upon the, the early ch stages of, of uh, childhood and how, uh, how gender identity gradually develops in, uh, in early childhood. So um, it's very interesting work, I think. Yeah. And indeed, um, it is a good uh, a complement uh, to, to Butler's work, which is, I, I do think that Butler at large is correct, but it's too general in a sense, the work about uh, performativity. Yeah. Right. And it's also maybe a little bit, um, I wouldn't say dated, but it, it seems as if the, the debates have, have moved, have engaged um, Butler's work um, to such an extent that there seems to be a need for a follow-up. Oh, Michael is saying goodbye. Sorry. Are you leaving us, Michael? So I uh, send a message in the chat. I have to pick up, uh, oh. take my son to school. I have to leave. <laughs> okay. okay. I, mean, I also, unfortunately, have to leave soon because I need to go and teach. But <laughs> Okay. Uh, Thank you, everybody. But it was a nice Bye. session. So, um, yeah. All right. Goodbye, Michael. Bye, Bye Michael. But perhaps can I just make a small comment about the Anfast of Sterling? I mean, she's actually been writing about this since the early 90s. Yes. So this is not recent work. That, I, mean, I mean, I mean, it might be recent work, but yeah, the idea yeah. that, I mean, and so this is, this would have coincided, um, I think the earliest that I know of that Anfast of Sterling has written about um, sex um, would coincide actually with sort of publication of gender trouble and, and so on. Yes. So these were in the early 90s. And so yeah, the yeah. thought that, I mean, I guess that's the sort of slightly perplexing thing is that I feel like a lot of these discussions that are currently going on in the sort of culture wars are discussions that we've had for 25 mm -hmm. years, 30 years. But, and now they have become this sort of, in a sense, more mainstreamy. So now you find them in, uh, in, in newspapers and politicians talking about this. And, and that mm -hmm. I'm not entirely, I sort of, Part of me kind of harks back to the good old days when these were only discussions had by academics <laughs> and not, not things that were sort of 
being fought yeah. in the in the public media well and that's where I was trying to come in I mean I do think that they you know they're important because of what they stand for and I actually I actually think there's a sort of another I mean this is why I was bringing it back to Judith Butler because I think her account of genderist performativity is so often misunderstood as a story about genderist performance and I think that the actual sort of speech act theory that underpins her account of performativity and the deconstructed kind of version of that that she uses is really relevant to the way in which gender is being used to organise certain positions in, in a political landscape. You know, that, that it's, it's at that level of the kind of manifestation of the authority to speak about things in a certain way um, that she's also tracking, you know, the ways in which our sense of who we, we who we belong with, who we have authority over, how our hierarchical you know ordering of the world takes place through gender. It was almost like flipping the narrative. So instead of, of talking about you know presumptions of masculine superiority and feminine inferiority, you're looking at how that that structural articulation is set up in the first place through the kind of um, authority that you mobilise through speaking of gender. So I think it's I think it's quite a subtle. Um, political theory sort of account of gender that I actually would draw out of, mm. of, of Butler um, rather than coming to these more sort of psychological or sociological kind of accounts of, of how gender is formed. Mm. Yeah. I'm sorry, as I said, my students are going to have to <laughs> yeah. are my next priority. So thank you so much. It was been, it's been great uh, meeting, meeting nice you all you. online and yeah. I hope to meet people at some, some stage again. <laughs> yeah, and I hope you feel better soon, Marie. Thank you. Yeah, for well, that. Is, uh, I mean, through. it's not COVID at least, but it's been uh, it's very uh, persistent. Mm, sorry about that. Okay, okay, okay. thank you. Bye. 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 So, are we <laughs> going to start <laughs> the day? I, I, I think so. Thank you very much, Louise, for organizing and. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to our audience. <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, it, it, it must be. It, I, I think this is a strange format for all of us. Uh, I don't know if any of you have had any experience with no, this kind no, of no. global meeting. And um, it's such a, a jam-packed program starting at early hours of the morning going on. I think my session is scheduled for this evening at quarter to nine. So um, I can imagine I'm also not going to have many <laughs> interlocutors except for the panel. But I think the panel in and of itself is is quite a nice um, occasion to exchange ideas. Uh, Louise, true. I don't know if, if you being the moderator, if you've had a chance to weigh in on um, your, you know, your own perspective on the matter, but by way of concluding maybe of leaving us with a, a final pearl of wisdom. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I thought all the angles were really very interesting. Um, well, maybe just one thought that I did think of is to say um, whenever I, I um, wonder about the fluidity of gender, I, I think back to my lived experience of puberty, you know, and remember how hard it is to adjust to all the changes of puberty and how to integrate that in your sense of self. Um, so I think that um, uh, the ambiguity around this, and I think if we are honest with ourselves, it's it's an ambiguity we all live through and, and quite a painful adaptation to having breasts, menstruation, the capacity mm -hmm. to become pregnant. What do you do with that? How does it position you in the world? Um, you know, that, it's, um, that gives me a lot of empathy for people who say, well, it hasn't worked mm -hmm. out. I never um, felt that I belonged in the body that I now socially and biologically live with. So, um, mm. you know, it's a, I think it's a kind of a Foucauldian perspective that's, that's maybe saying um, the, the ambiguity is the larger thing. The certainties are, are small and few and far between. Um, and if you make it a general human experience, so, so that's my one angle. The other, so, so it, it touches on the phenomenological approach also that Anami mm. suggests, but also a, a critique of uh, the Western paradigm that I um, see more and more that um, there's a sense that indigenous cosmologies and um, 
ontologies are, are much more fluid, you know, resistant of um, static metaphysics and um, the, the mind over matter um, dichotomy that is so central to, to this strange Western tradition. It's really idiosyncratic in that sense. <laughs> Almost all the other traditions see it as a, as a distortion and a, and a, and a yeah, misunderstanding. So, so, so from, I would also take my critique of it from, a, say, a decolonial perspective as well and say, well, in a more fluid ontology and a more um, dynamic materialism, things make more, uh, or um, gender is not static, you know, and so, so um, I can also link it up with, with ontologies and cosmologies that, that are not purely secular, but that go into a, a different, um, yeah, a different spirituality almost. I, sorry, I'm not expressing this very well. I can see that on your face, but I'm, yeah. No, I think you're expressing it very clearly. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and I do think that's one little thing that I still want to say, because we were talking about uh, how harmful this sex gender distinction is. But I do think it is, for instance, I'm also working together with uh, uh, some uh, uh, people from uh, medicine. And uh, we have been um, investigating how the use of these notions of sex and gender in uh, various um, uh, uh, articles uh, in, in the field of medicine. And what you see is that these, uh, this, this distinction is repeated constantly, but that the meaning that is given to the concept is 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 different in in different uh, articles, and that is it seems to be sort of general consensus. We need to use this, these concepts of sex and gender because everyone knows uh, uh, what they mean, uh, but but uh, uh, what they actually in all of these different projects are, uh, about, for instance, uh, in, in cardiology, but also in gen genetics, what these notions mean differs in all of these different disciplines and also in uh, different articles within these disciplines. So, so it's it's really uh, uh, a mess i think <laughs> so uh, and as philosophers i think that it's, it's important to uh, uh, to the, to uh, focus upon these terms that i used and the confusion uh, around these terms so yeah mm. and to try to yeah. clarify things a bit <laughs> so you, yeah yeah try and um yeah so you have to you have to qualify them so much that you almost look for new constellations yes, like, precisely, like precisely, your precisely. self body and 